welcome back for another Sheriff of Sodium video. Today I'm going to again share with you a talk that was given and intended for a different audience. Um, this was given to us a group of program directors and academic physicians who are considering what to do in a post step one world. What are they going to do once step one goes pass fail? And I was one of four speakers. I was the first to go and my talk was supposed to address step one pass fail. How did we get here? And if you spend any time on this channel, you know that this is a topic that I could discuss at some length. But here I had to be brief because I wanted to leave plenty of room for the other discussants who really were the meat of this, this discussion. Um, still, before you try to plan what to do in a post-step one world, it's critical that you understand how we got here. How did a multiple choice question test of basic science with only peripheral relevance to actual patient care become the king of medical education and residency selection and then collapse under the force of its own weight? To answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning of USMLE in 1992. So that's where we're going to start, part one, the rise. Because the roots of what I like to call step one mania are related to a confluence of three events that all occurred in the early to mid 1990s and together those three events set in motion the USMLE step one arms race. Event number one was the creation of the USMLE in 1992. Before then for US medical graduates there were two parallel pathways to licensure. You could take the NBME exams which resembled the three-part USMLE series that would follow it or you could take a different exam called the FLEX, the Federation Licensing Exam. After the USMLE, there was a single pathway to licensure for everyone, and for the first time, a single common measuring stick that could be used in applicant evaluation or screening. Event number two was a change in the residency application market space such that the number of residency applicants began to outpace the number of available positions. This graphic shows the ratio of positions to applicants, and if you go back to 1992, the first year of the USMLE, there were actually more PGY-1 positions available than there were applicants in the NRMP match. But every year since, there have been more applicants than positions. Now that disparity has been stable for about the past 20 years. Still, to maximize their chance of selection, residency applicants began to apply to more and more programs. And event number three is the introduction of ARIS, the Electronic Residency Application Service, in the mid-1990s. Before ARIS, in an era of Xerox copy machines and snail mail, applying to residency was a cumbersome process. And applicants, even in the most competitive specialties, applied to only 20 programs apiece. Applicants in less competitive fields applied to only 10. But after ARIS, if you had a mouse and a credit card, you could apply to as many programs as you wanted. In other words, at the very same time that market changes gave students an incentive to overapply, we gave them the very tool that they needed to do it. Because applying to more programs than an otherwise identical competitor applicant confers a relative advantage in this competitive space, we have an arms race where each year students submit more and more residency applications. By 2020, the mean number of applications submitted and this is across all applicants and all specialties. The mean number of applications submitted was 70 for USMD students and 139 for international medical graduates. Naturally, as programs began to get more and more overwhelmed with applications, they gravitated to the only numeric measure that they could apply to every single applicant, the step one score. And so what we saw was a steady increase in the use of USMLE step one scores in applicant evaluation. You can see the effects here. In 1979, a survey of program directors found that NBME Part 1 scores were ranked 23rd out of 31 possible factors that could be used in candidate evaluation. Things look a little bit different these days, where the USMLE Step 1 score is consistently the most cited factor by program directors responding to the NRMP's program director survey. Of course, we all know what happened next. The very factors that led to our idolatry of the Step 1 score led to its implosion. That brings us to Part 2, the fall. When you use Step 1 scores for candidate evaluation, students begin spending more and more time preparing for Step 1 because their results matter. In fact, when programs use cutoff scores, the USMLE score is the only thing that matters. I mean, if you want somebody to actually read your application. 
And so every year, students would spend more and more time studying for the USMLE exam, and the mean test score went up accordingly. This graphic shows just how striking that trend has been, as we've increased from a mean score of around 200 in 1994, all the way up to 230 by 2018, which is the last year for which data are available. To put these numbers in some context, a 200 today would put you in the ninth percentile of all test takers, even though that was a perfectly average, completely respectable score in the early days of the test. In contrast, someone who scores at the average today, a 230, they would have been in the 93rd percentile if they'd taken the test in 1992. In the era of Step 1 mania, first aid for the USMLE grew from a modest 136-page review book to an over 800-page tome that students were advised to memorize word for word as the bare minimum amount of test prep. But since we decided that we should choose our future otolaryngologists based on their immediate factual recall of viral strand sense or G protein subunits, students were stuck. So they spent more and more time learning material that was less and less useful to their future patients because they were engaged in an arms race with their future colleagues that had no natural end. The opportunity costs of this were significant. In fact, if you total up the amount of time cumulatively, that students spend studying for step one just during their dedicated study periods, that cumulative effort amounts to around 1,880 person years every year. To put that input into some kind of scale of human accomplishment, you should know that that collective input is more than 100-fold more than the person time required to write the source code for the Apollo 11 mission that put a man on the moon. Now maybe, maybe that would be a virtue, maybe that would be worth it, if step one captured the attributes and competencies that we care about in medicine. But it doesn't. It's a multiple choice question test of basic science. Nothing more, nothing less. And as eloquent medical educators like William McGahey have reminded us, physicians do not report for work in hospitals and clinics and spend the day answering multiple choice questions. And there were more troublesome aspects of using step one scores in the way that we were doing. The NBME's own research showed that there were significant demographic differences in step one performance. Compared to a white male reference group, women score almost six points lower on step one, Asians 4.5 points lower, Hispanic and black test takers 12 to 16 points lower. It's very hard to look at these data and claim that these differences don't matter, that they don't have a regressive effect, especially when we use USMLE cut scores to limit the application pile. And it was for all of these reasons, as well as some others that I don't have the time to delve into, that our continued reliance on Step 1 scores in residency selection was simply not sustainable. And so, in 2019, the NBME convened a group of stakeholders to consider changes to USMLE scoring. And by February of 2020, just before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States, they announced that scores would become pass-fail as soon as January of 2022. What's happened since then is a little bit funny. Instead of seizing this as the greatest opportunity since the Flexner Report to reform medical education, I have instead seen this wave of step one nostalgia. There have been at least a dozen or so journal articles with survey data from program directors saying how bad pass-fail scoring is going to be, with faculty and program directors bemoaning this loss of objectivity and waxing poetic about level playing fields. Folks, give me a break. Make no mistake, a pass-fail step one is on the right side of history. To do nothing was to allow continued erosion of medical education, to sit idly by while our students, our future colleagues, fight a never-ending arms race that drains their energy and saps their empathy and devalues clinical skills education, all just so we can give ourselves a convenient way to not read most of the applications we receive. We should not be proud of our step one idol worship, and nor should anybody shed too many tears about its demise. The reality is, step one was never intended. It was never designed to be the residency aptitude test, and all the claims that it functions well as such are weak post hoc justifications. Step one was a convenience metric. It made our lives easier, and it kept us from having to make transformative change. And let's be honest, transformative change is hard. In my opinion, it took real courage and foresight to smash this graven image, and we should seize it as an opportunity. But it's not going to be easy. And here I'm going to be frank 
because there were certain advantages to the step one based system. But instead of eulogizing step one in the academic literature, I think we need to frankly acknowledge what people liked about step one and try to address that in our future systems. And here, I think there are four things worth considering. Number one is programs need something to filter applications. That is, they need something to filter applications if we choose to live in a world of limitless applications. Number two is that step one was an objective metric and the lure of objectivity is, is powerful. Number three, underdogs need a way to compete. We don't want a system that calcifies privilege and pedigree. Instead, we want to incentivize and reward the kinds of excellence that matter. Last, step one created a system of winners and losers. Was it the best system? Was it even a fair system? Probably not. But it had some internal rhyme and reason, and, and people liked that. You want to become an otolaryngologist at a prestigious program? Well, here's how. You world first aid, Anki, Pathoma, Sketchy. That's how. What do students do now? And so I realize that I'm leaving you with some important questions, but it's time for me at this point to turn over the talk to others. So that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to me.